new study has found that supermassive black holes can generate enough energy to affect the evolution of entire galaxies. The new research, reported in the journal Science, provides the best proof yet that the growth of supermassive black holes, found at the heart of most if not all galaxies, directly controls star formation in that galaxy. Astronomers have long noticed that the size of a supermassive black hole appears to be directly proportional to the size of the galaxy it's in. The new data shows a persistent almost spherical stream of very powerful highly ionized gas flowing out of a supermassive black hole into the rest of the galaxy. One of the study's authors, Professor Fiona Harrison from the California Institute of Technology, says it was astonishing that a supermassive black hole no bigger than our solar system could be powerful enough to influence the entire galaxy. Harrison and colleagues made their discovery by combining data from the European Space Agency's XMM-Newton and NASA's New Star Earth Orbiting Space Telescopes. They studied high-energy X-rays being emitted from a nearby quasar called PDS-456. Quasars are powerful beams of energy generated by black holes which are visible for billions of light years. That makes them some of the brightest objects in the universe. They're generated by matter being destroyed as it falls onto the accretion disk of a black hole before passing through the black hole's event horizon, a sort of point of no return, beyond which matter disappears from our universe as it falls forever towards the black hole's singularity. Most quasars are ancient and very distant, even by cosmic standards, dating back to around 10 or 11 billion light years or more. However, PDS-456 is located just 2 billion light years away. That makes this a perfect laboratory to study the epoch of quasars in the universe. The supermassive black hole at the centre of PDS-456 is estimated to have 10 billion times the mass of our Sun. Now, by comparison, the supermassive black hole at the centre of our galaxy, the Milky Way, which is called Sagittarius A star, has just 4.3 million times the mass of the Sun. Astronomers studying PDS-456 knew material falling into the black hole was emitting a wind of outflowing particles. The question is just how much energy was in this wind and was that enough to influence the galaxy as a whole? The combined data obtained by using both XMM-Newton and Eustar covered a wide range of X-ray wavelengths and showed that the energy emitted by the quasar wasn't just a single narrow jet, but a far broader wide beam in all directions. XMM-Newton had previously observed lower energy X-rays caused by iron atoms being carried along by these winds. The spectra from these iron signatures was being blue-shifted by the Doppler effect, indicating they were moving towards us. The problem is, XMM-Newton couldn't tell just how wide or narrow the beam was, because it could only detect absorption features in the spectra, which by definition can only occur in front of a background light source, in this case the quasar. To determine what was happening to the sides of the quasar, Harrison and colleagues needed to find a different feature known as an emission spectra, which occurs when iron scatters X-ray light in all directions, not just towards the observer. And New Star allowed the authors to observe these higher energy X-rays where these iron emission signatures occur. And it was this which confirmed that the black hole winds weren't just blowing directly towards us, but also to the sides and in all directions. The new data shows a persistent, almost spherical stream of very powerful highly ionized gas flowing out of the black hole. These winds, which astronomers are calling ultra-fast outflows, or UFOs for short, yes, you heard right, are strong enough to disrupt molecular gas and dust clouds, thereby preventing them from collapsing to form new stars. Until now, astronomers have been unable to detect a wind strong and persistent enough to impact its host galaxy in this way. Harrison says the new measurements tell scientists not only that this material is flowing out incredibly fast, at a significant fraction of the speed of light in fact, but also it's very powerful, which is something astronomers previously had only been able to speculate about. Yeah, so most of the quasars that we find are distant. They were born earlier in the universe. And the thing about PDS-456 is it's an incredibly powerful AGN, a quasar that's close relatively speaking. It also has these very powerful winds that blow off of the material that's being eaten by this large black hole. And how does it change our understanding of the universe? And, you know, the thing about black holes, I mean, they're black, right? No light can escape from the black hole itself, but they don't live in isolation. When they live in galaxies, dust and gas can fall onto them. This dust and gas can organize itself into a disk and friction can turn the gravitational energy of the stuff falling onto the black hole into heat and accelerate particles. 
close to the speed of light and basically create a giant engine in the center of the galaxy. And if this engine emits enough energy, it can influence galaxies and therefore make a connection between the black hole and the galaxy. And so astronomers have been looking for evidence of this connection that we call feedback, basically the black hole influencing the entire galaxy. Now, in PDS 456, what we found is astronomers had known that this black hole, this material falling onto the black hole, also was emitting a wind of particles flowing out. And the question was, how much energy is in this wind? Is that energy enough to actually influence the galaxy? And what we've been able to do with this new measurement is find out that not only is this material flowing out incredibly fast, like a fraction of, you know, tenth of the speed of light, but also it's very powerful. This wind is coming off basically over all angles, and this is pumping enough power into the galaxy to actually rival the power in star formation and influence the energetics of this galaxy. And so this is a connection between the black hole and the galaxy. Is there a name for these winds? Do we have a name for them? Just feedback winds? Or, you can't call them stellar winds, astronomers really. Astronomers have coined are, is ultra-fast outflows, UFOs. I don't, UFOs. Know I, can, I don't know if I can say that with a straight face, but I do love it. These UFOs, what they're doing, I take it, is they're so powerful, they're literally blowing the molecular gas and dust of the galaxy out of the galaxy. Yeah, so they, they can what they can do is influence the dust and gas in, in, in the galaxy, which alters the rate of, of formation of stars and basically influences the growth of the galaxy, the evolution of the galaxy. How did you come about this discovery that we're looking at X-ray spectra? This was an object that it was already known to have a, a fast wind. And we decided to team up with ESA's XMM-Newton telescope, team up with New Star because together they cover a very wide range of X-ray energies or colors. A lot of wavelengths. Uh, all, all of the X-ray, yeah, a lot of wavelengths. So what we were able to do by putting the data together is show that the previous model based only on low energy x-ray data wasn't actually right and that we could by studying absorption from iron we could determine that again the previous models weren't correct and that in fact we could prove that this wind was very wide angle and contains a lot of energy huge amounts according to the the figures that's right it's really astonishing i mean you know if you think about it it's this incredible i mean just think of that black hole is small, right? Black holes, you know, even a supermassive black hole is sort of the size of the solar system, yet just because of the intense gravity and what happens when stuff falls onto it, it can it's so powerful it influences this entire galaxy. I mean it's it's amazing if you think about it. That's Professor Fiona Harrison from the California Institute of Technology. Meanwhile, a study of spherical-shaped collections of stars called elliptical galaxies are providing a different insight into the connection between a galaxy and its central supermassive black hole. The study, reported in the Astrophysical Journal, claims that it's the invisible hand of dark matter which somehow influences black hole growth. Scientists at the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics claim there seems to be a mysterious link between the amount of dark matter a galaxy holds and the size of its central supermassive black hole, even though the two operate on vastly different scales. Now, as we heard earlier, previous observations have found a relationship between the mass of a supermassive black hole at the center of a galaxy and the total mass of the stars in that galaxy. However, studies have also suggested a tight correlation between the masses of a supermassive black hole and the mass of the galaxy's dark matter halo. What wasn't clear is which relationship dominated. Dark matter outweighs normal matter and everyday stuff we see around us by a factor of 6 to 1. We know dark matter exists because of its gravitational influence on normal matter what scientists call baryonic matter, the stuff stars, planets, trees, cars, dogs, cats, houses and people are made out of. Dark matter holds galaxies and galaxy clusters together. 
Every galaxy is surrounded by a halo of dark matter that weighs as much as a trillion suns and extends out for hundreds of thousands of light years. To investigate the link between dark matter halos and supermassive black holes, scientists have been studying more than 3,000 elliptical galaxies. Using data from the Rosat X-ray Satellites All-Sky Survey and the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, they use the motions of stars as a tracer to weigh the galaxy's central black holes. X-ray measurements of hot gas surrounding galaxies help determine the dark matter halo because the more dark matter a galaxy has, the more hot gas it can hold on to. They found a distinct relationship between the mass of the dark matter halo and the mass of the black hole. Now that's a relationship which was stronger than the relationship between the mass of the black hole and the mass of the galaxy stars. The connection could be related to how elliptical galaxies grow. You see, an elliptical galaxy is formed when smaller galaxies merge, their stars and dark matter mingling and mixing together. Because the dark matter outweighs everything else, it moulds the newly formed elliptical galaxy and guides the growth of the central black hole. Scientists say that, in effect, the act of merging creates a gravitational blueprint for the galaxy, and the stars in the galaxy then follow along. Astronomers have identified the closest known flyby of another star to our solar system. A report in the Astrophysical Journal Letters claims the star system passed our Sun by less than a light year some 70,000 years ago. The flyby occurred at a distance of 0.8 light years. That's five times closer than the nearest star to the Sun, Proxima Centauri, which is between 4.2 and 4.3 light years away. The astronomers say no other star is known to have ever approached our solar system this close. The claim is based on the discovery of a low-mass stellar system some 20 light years away, which they've nicknamed Schultz's star. The system is a binary, comprising an M-type red dwarf, about 8% the mass of the Sun, and a brown dwarf with about 6% the Sun's mass, the two orbiting each other. Brown dwarfs are failed stars, objects which are too big to be planets, but didn't accumulate enough mass to spark the core nuclear fusion process which makes stars like our Sun shine. The formal designation of this newly discovered star system is WISE J072003.20-08472. Which is why it's been nicknamed Schultz's star in honour of its discoverer, Ralph Dieter Schultz. Astronomers took spectrographic readings using telescopes in South Africa and Chile to calculate the trajectory and velocity of the system. They discovered that about 70,000 years ago, this binary passed through the outer reaches of our solar system's Oort cloud, about 8 trillion kilometres from the Sun, 52,000 times further from the Sun than the Earth. And although that sounds like a long way away, in cosmic terms, it's a close encounter. The Oort cloud is a region of space which contains comets and other icy debris, much of which is outside our solar system, but still under the gravitational influence of the Sun. Now, occasionally, objects from this region can be nudged into new orbits through collisions with other objects or just by gravitational perturbations coming too close to another object, and that takes them into our solar system, where astronomers classify them as long-period comets. Scientists realised what Schultz's star was by its unusual mix of characteristics. Despite being fairly close, it showed a very slow tangential motion, that is, a motion across the sky. However, radial velocity measurements showed the star was moving almost directly away from our solar system at considerable speed. The small tangential motion in proximity initially indicated the star was most likely either moving towards a close encounter with our solar system, or it had recently come from a close encounter and was now moving away. The radial velocity measurements were consistent with it moving away from the Sun's vicinity, pointing to a close flyby in the past. Now, while we're talking about the outer reaches of our solar system, it seems instead of being shaped like a giant comet, the Sun's domain, or heliosphere, is actually shaped more like a giant kidney bean. The revelation comes from new data indicating that the Sun's magnetic field plays a far more crucial role in shaping the heliosphere than previously thought. The heliosphere is this bubble around the Sun created by the solar wind, the constant flow of charged particles streaming out of the Sun. It's the Sun's outer atmosphere. What we call the solar system, with all the planets and the Kuiper belt and much of the Oort cloud, are inside this heliosphere. 
When it exited the heliosphere in August 2012 at a distance of 18,101,342,000 kilometres from the Sun, the Voyager 1 spacecraft officially left our solar system and entered interstellar space. This new view of the heliosphere was discovered quite by accident as scientists studying some surprising data from the Voyager 1 spacecraft were trying to understand how the galaxy's magnetic field interacts with the heliosphere. For decades, scientists had sort of visualised the heliosphere as sort of like a comet-shaped bubble surrounding the Sun. As the Sun travels through space, the forward edge of this bubble, facing the oncoming interstellar winds, is being flattened by the effect of those winds at a bow shock point. Meanwhile, at the opposite end, the aft end of the heliosphere, that would be elongated into a long tail by the interstellar wind slipstream effect. However, this new research, reported in the Astrophysical Journal Letters, is suggesting that the Sun's magnetic field controls the large-scale shape of the heliosphere far more than had previously been thought. Based on the Voyager 1 data, scientists at Boston University developed a new model showing how the Sun's magnetic field squeezes the heliosphere along the Sun's north-south magnetic axes. In the process, it produces two jets that are then dragged downstream by the flow of the interstellar medium through which the Sun's moving. And so if you're outside looking down at the heliosphere, you're looking at something shaped more like a kidney bean than a comet. The models also indicate these heliospheric jets, as they're being called, are very turbulent, and that would make them good particle accelerators. And astronomers are speculating these jets may play a role in the acceleration of so-called anomalous cosmic ray particles. Because the heliosphere acts like a protective shield to cocoon Earth by filtering out galactic cosmic rays, understanding the physical phenomena that governs the shape of the heliosphere will help scientists understand this filtering process. As it approached and then crossed the boundary of the heliosphere, Voyager 1 did not register the anticipated major change in the direction of the magnetic field as it made the crossing. Struggling to explain these unexpected results, astronomers ran large-scale computer simulations which eventually showed the unexpected two-tailed shape. More data on the heliosphere's boundaries will become available sometime in the next few years when the Voyager 2 spacecraft also crosses into interstellar space. Astronomers have finally confirmed that stellar explosions known as novae are producing large amounts of lithium, one of the key elements in the chemical evolution of the universe. The findings reported in the journal Nature provide the first direct evidence that lithium, which is used for lithium-ion batteries and computers, smartphones and eco-cars, is being produced in significant amounts by stellar objects. The study's lead author, Dr. Akira Tajitsu from the National Astronomical Observatory in Japan, says understanding the way lithium is produced means scientists can now understand pretty well every process of elemental production in the universe. Together with hydrogen and helium, small amounts of lithium were generated directly through the Big Bang in a process called nucleosynthesis. And scientists know new lithium is produced through collisions between cosmic ray particles and gas in the interstellar medium. Chemical evolution models and observed lithium abundances in the Milky Way indicate that at least half of all lithium must be produced by other means, possibly old bloated stars called red giants, their successors known as asymptotic giant branch stars, and also possibly by novae. However, lithium is very fragile at the high temperatures found in stars, and so there's very little direct evidence to support the idea of novae being a major source of lithium. A nova is an extremely bright thermonuclear explosion on the surface of a white dwarf. White dwarfs are the slowly cooling cores of stars like our Sun after they've run out of their hydrogen and helium fuel supplies. Our Sun will become a white dwarf in about 6 billion years' time. A nova occurs if the white dwarf is in a close orbit with another star and gravitationally sucks material off that companion star. As more and more material builds up on the surface of the white dwarf, the increase in temperature and pressure ignites this material in a runaway nuclear fusion event, causing a sudden explosion on the white dwarf's surface called a nova. And because the explosion doesn't destroy the white dwarf, it's free to suck more material from this other star and go nova again and again and again. On August 16th, 2013, astronomers detected the first naked eye nova since 2007. Located in the northern constellation Delphinus, the nova, Latin for new star, was named V339 Delphini. Tejitsu and colleagues used a spectrograph on the Superu telescope in Hawaii to study the light coming from the nova 40 days after the blast. 
Spectroscopy allows scientists to identify different chemical signatures by the way light is absorbed or emitted at specific wavelengths. The authors detected sets of strong absorption lines at ultraviolet wavelengths which turned out to be radioactive beryllium-7 being blasted out during the nova explosion. Beryllium-7 is an unstable isotope of beryllium with a half-life of 53 days. As it was blasted into cooler environments away from the heat of the white dwarf, it decayed into the stable isotope lithium-7, and the lithium-7 was far enough away from the white dwarf not to be destroyed. Because white dwarfs have long lives and can experience multiple nova events, the findings support the idea that maybe up to half of all the lithium in the universe today was produced through stellar evolution. Dr Lilia Ferrario from the Australian National University studies white dwarfs and was not involved in the research. She says until now it's been difficult to understand how lithium-7 could form and survive in extreme temperatures such as Nova. But this new discovery helps solve that problem. Nova explosions tend to be recurrent, so the same star can undergo this kind of explosions more than once. And this is what differs them from a supernovae event when you have that the star is completely ripped apart by an explosion. It is a much more violent event and it is a one-off for that star. This one is a so-called classical nova, which means that probably, yes, this star has been exploding more than once. Lithium yeah. is very fragile. It won't survive yeah. in the heat of the nova event itself, but further away from the star, where the environment is cooler, there the beryllium can decay into lithium-7 and the lithium-7 will stay. It won't be destroyed. Yes, it is a very fragile um, element and it has been a very difficult to try to figure out how it could possibly form and uh, uh, how it can survive. And uh, so for a long, long time, people have been uh, wondering whether it formed mostly during the Big Bang event. During the Big Bang, we, we have the formation of um, hydrogen and the helium and uh, isotopes of hydrogen and helium. But some other elements like lithium and beryllium and possibly boron as well, they are much more difficult to explain. We observe them in ancient stars so we know that they have been created somehow but exactly what kind of a percentage would come from Big Bang and how much would come from uh, later stellar evolution that's always been a very um, a very difficult question to answer and so this one really seems to be nailing it down I mean we know now that it is possible to produce it during nova explosions. Is it a significant percentage of the lithium we see in the universe today? The Nature article seems to suggest we can have maybe up to half of the lithium could be produced during stellar evolution. So this is, seems to be a good indication that yes, it is a significant amount that could originate this way. Do you think it's an important step in understanding the chemical history of the universe, the chemical yeah. evolution? Yes, 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 absolutely, yes. Any any little bit more than we can add to our knowledge is, uh, is something that, yes, can be used to understand the origin of uh, elements and the, the, what the universe is made of, where we come from and everything else. So, yes, it is very exciting, yes. That's Dr Lilia Ferrario from the Australian National University. Japanese researchers have built a pair of clocks they say are so accurate they'll only lose a second every 16 billion years. Now, that's over three times longer than the Earth's been around. Cryogenic optical lattice clocks are not pretty. In fact, they look more like a giant stripped-down desktop computer than ordinary wall clocks. But they are so precise that current technology can't measure any inaccuracies in them. The research team from the University of Tokyo who built the new clock believes it's taken the technology way beyond atomic clocks that are currently running and used to define the second. The new clocks use special lasers to trap strontium atoms in tiny grid-like structures. A report in the journal Nature Photonics claims the frequency of the vibration of the atoms can then be measured like an atomic pendulum. The system's so delicate it can only operate in a cold environment around minus 180 degrees Celsius in order to reduce the impact of the surrounding electromagnetic waves and to maintain the machine's accuracy. Researchers built two of these clocks and connected them for a month and based on their data they estimate it would take at least 16 billion years for the two clocks to develop a one second difference. 
that's significantly more accurate than today's standard cesium atomic clocks used to define the second. They can develop a one-second error every 30 million years. The new technology could be applied to satellite-based global positioning systems and communications networks, and it can also serve as a foundation for future research on a redefinition of what a second is. Ever since I was a kid, and even today, the one big question burning in my soul is why haven't we got flying cars yet? After all, they were commonplace in the Jetsons. Well, it now looks like the future may finally have arrived. A New Zealand aviation company has just raised $27 million on the Australian share market to further develop what could be the first personalised jet pack, or in this case, rotor pack, and it would have military, commercial, and of course recreational uses. Using a small 200 horsepower piston engine, the Martin Jetpack, as it's called, can fly as high as 1,000 metres, stay in the air for 30 minutes, and carry 120 kilos, assuming you're brave enough to strap it on. Orders are already being taken for a 2017 commercial release of the equipment, with a lot of interest coming from wealthy individuals in China. Martin Aircraft Chief Executive Peter Coker spoke with the ABC's Peter Ryan. Our primary audience to start with is the first responder, which is fire, police, ambulance, water security and search and rescue, including natural disaster recovery people. It all sounds rather futuristic, something like science fiction, but you're saying the future is almost here. People might soon be flying around in strap-on personalised jetpacks in a couple of years' time. Yes, I mean, I think the, uh, the, the programme has been going for 30 years when Glenn Martin just first thought about it. Uh, and what we've done is we've now started to commercialise the aircraft itself. It, it's flying around, it's flying around with people, it's flying around unmanned as well. Um, and I think we are absolutely there. It'll be a little time before we have one for the personal jetpack, purely because we're actually targeting a different audience and a different customer to start with. How much does a, a single jetpack cost? It's certainly not a cheap transport solution. So we're targeting around about 200,000 US dollars for the first responder market. But we see that coming down certainly for the individual jetpack and the recreation jetpack to about 150,000 US dollars in the future. We have a lot of pre-orders already in terms for individual jetpacks. We also look at it and saying, hey, this could be something like a motorbike in the sky in the future for third dimensional travel. These jetpacks uh, can be flown both manned and unmanned. Um, once we go up to uh, beyond about sort of, you know, 20, 30 metres, we're going to need a parachute. Parachute gets integrated in the next uh, six months or so. Uh, that'll make it the safest aircraft probably in the world. Presumably uh, an owner or a pilot would need to be like Licensed. Yes, it's registered as a microlight aircraft in the New Zealand Civil Aviation Authority. So at this stage, the, the pilot needs to have a uh, microlight license to fly the aircraft. So how soon before people are flying around city streets in jetpacks or maybe I'm taking one to work in the morning? Yeah, and I think this is something in the future when you look at the dream. But, but actually, at the end of the day, the, the regulatory authorities need to be able to adjust their thinking to a third dimensional transport environment. And we, we've been in discussion with a number of regulatory authorities. And, you know, I I don't think it's going to be that too far before we actually see people flying around with a jetpack going to work. Martin Aircraft's Chief Executive Peter Coker with the ABC's Business Editor, Peter Ryan. And that's the show for now. If you're in the United States and you're listening to Star Stuff as a radio broadcast, don't forget you can also subscribe to the show as a weekly podcast through iTunes or download it from the ABC Science website at abc.net.au forward slash science forward slash star stuff. Also check out the Star Stuff blog, which contains heaps of space and astronomy news we can't fit in the show, lots of spectacular images and much more as well. Just Google starstuffblog.tumblr.com. That's all one word in lower case, and that's Tumblr without the E. And don't forget the official ABC Star Stuff Twitter feed for the latest Star Stuff broadcast times, radio stations, and publishing details. Just type in the at symbol, followed by ABC Star Stuff, all one word in lower case, and you'll never miss a thing. <laughs>